The purpose of this video is to discuss the slide object and all of its different features and functions. Now the slide object is one of the most fully featured objects in E-Prime. So this video may be a little long, but we are going to cover all of the properties of the slide object. Now to add a slide object to your experiment, all you do is take a slide object from the toolbox and drag and drop it onto your procedure. Now by default, the slide will be called slide one. Every other slide that I add after that, if I do not change this slide one object's name, will be slide two, then slide three, and so on and so forth. To change the name of a slide object, all I have to do is click on it once, right click, click rename. I can also click F2 on the keyboard and just change it to anything I want. Now to edit the properties of a slide object, once you've added it to your experiment, all you have to do is double click on it to open it in the eStudio workspace. So right there. So you'll notice a lot of properties about the slide object all along the top here. You'll also notice a lot of objects that look very similar to the toolbox along the left hand side of the slide object. I'm going to focus on the properties first and then move into the slide sub objects. Now first we have two very similar properties page icons. One on the left of this little box here and one on the right of this little box. The one on the left is the properties page for the entire slide object itself. So if we click on the properties page here, we're going to see properties that have to do with the entire slide and not just specific features of the slide. So the first tab that appears is this general tab. We have something called the active state property. This lets us know what slide state is currently active. We'll go into adding and removing slide states a little later. The next is the display name. This lets you determine where E Prime is going to show this slide. Is it going to show up on the left screen or the right screen or display one or display two? In this case, we only have one display object. The input source allows you to determine how the slide object is going to look in the data file. So is the accuracy or the .acc, the RT or the reaction time or the response value, is it going to show up in relation to an input mask that is set on the slide object or will it be in relation to a slide slider, a slide button, or a slide choice sub-object? The next tab we have here is the duration input tab. The duration input tab allows you to do two things. First, it allows you to determine how long the object stays on the screen. That is its duration property right here. If you click on the drop down, you can see that we can select a couple of preset values, including infinite, but this also allows you to input custom values, and it allows you to input attribute references. An attribute reference is simply just a reference to an attribute that you made earlier. The data logging tab allows you to pick several data logging options. Um, we have standard, which is going to log both response options and time audit options. Response only, which will log only response related data. Uh, time audit only, which will only log timing related data. So uh, how long was this on the screen? Um, were there any errors in relation to this? and any custom data logging that you'd like. We're gonna talk more about data logging a little later. We have timing mode. The timing mode has three different options. Event timing mode allows you to prioritize the timing of this object over the timing of your entire procedure. Cumulative timing mode allows you to prioritize the timing of the entire procedure against the timing of the single object. So the duration of this object may be in flux a little bit in order to make sure the timing of the entire procedure is more stable. And then custom, which we generally don't recommend. Um, there are specific instances where custom is necessary, but generally speaking, we don't recommend turning on custom timing mode unless a member of our product service and support staff recommends that you do. So just under all of those properties on the top of the slide, we have these input mask properties. Now an input mask in E-Prime is a way to interact with the slide object. And if I click add, you can see by default, I can interact with it via keyboard, mouse, or button object. By adding either one of these, you can see that the response options portion on the right will now be active. I have my allowable, which will be set to any by default, but allows me to specify which key, either on the mouse, keyboard, or button that I'm interacting with the correct, which is where I can input any correct answer, and my time limit. Now time limit and duration sound very similar, but they're actually very different. Duration represents how long this object is on the screen. The time limit represents how long participants have to interact with this object on the screen. Now the time limit could be greater than the duration if you would like the screen to change while participants are still able to interact with this object or you can make it shorter than the duration if you'd like participants to respond to this object and only have a very short amount of time to do so. You can then determine what happens once the participant makes a response, 
using this end action property. And you can set it to either none, which means if the participants respond, nothing happens. Terminate, which means if the participant responds, it moves on. And jump, which means if you respond using this input mask, E prime will go to a different point in the experiment, um, specifically to a label object, which we will discuss in a different video. So aside from the duration input tab, we also have our task events. Now task events in E prime, if you look here, if you click add, allow you to respond to different parts of this object. So what this means is that I'm able to time lock different events. So sending signals, um, completing um, any script that I had written allows me to time lock those with different parts of this slide object. So as you can see, I can time lock things with the onset time, with the offset time, the start time, finish time, and action time. I also have my keyboard and input mask options here. If I had any input mask, that will also appear there. And then also some different mouse button and keyboard um, related properties down here. So this is where I would add those task events if I was using those. We have an experiment advisor tab. Um, in this, it allows us to choose different stats that experiment advisor will include in its report. Uh, so do I want onset to onset statistics for this slide object? Do I want onset delay statistics or load time statistics? If I don't want any of them, they are off by default. Now I have my logging tab. This is where I decide what dependent measures or what dependent variables are going to be logged by the slide object. Um, everything up here, so the ACC uh, correct response, response RT and RT time, these are all going to be logged by that response only property. And then these time audit properties here, so duration error, onset delay, onset time, and onset to onset time, are logged by that time audit only property. And then a combination of both of them that look exactly like I have right now is what standard logging is going to get me. And if I scroll down, there's also a bunch of other options that I can log as well. Clicking on the sync tab allows you to sync the onset and offset of this object. So right now the onset is currently set to sync with the vertical blank of the screen. I can also opt out of that. And then the same thing with the offset. Do I want the offset to sync with a vertical blank or not? And the last tab we have here is the common tab. The common tab has to do with the name of the object, if you're adding any special data tags, and if you have any notes about this object. And then down here we have a script generation property. So um, am I generating this object pre-run? at the top of procedure or before this object is run, and then afterwards am I going to generate the offset uh, at the end of the procedure or after the object run. Generally speaking, we recommend keeping these objects at their default value of inherit, which means it's going to get its property from something else. And this handles conditional exit, allows you to potentially conditionally exit out of this object if you so choose. So those are the properties of the slide object. The next we have this sub object properties page. This sub object properties page is going to show you the properties of any object that appears in this little window right here. Right now I currently only have a slide state, but once I start adding my slide sub objects, you'll begin to see what I mean. Right now I currently only have a slide state selected, but once I start adding all of these slide sub objects, this is going to start to fill out pretty quickly and I'll have many more options. The next property here is adding a slide state. So right now I currently have one slide state and it's best to think of these as almost pages of a book. So which page am I going to display to participants when this runs? I can add a completely new one which will add a blank slide state. I also have the option to clone a slide state. So if I have objects that are already on this, I like how they look, I like where they are, I can click on clone slide state and it'll make an exact copy of this slide state on a different one. And if I add one there, you can see at the bottom of my slide, I now have two slide states that I can choose between. I have the option here. This is the Z order tab. I can take different objects in E-Prime and either bring them to the front or to the back of all of the objects that are currently on the screen. I can change my cursor options over here. I can either opt to zoom in, which will make the slide much larger. I can opt to zoom out, which will make it considerably smaller. Or and I will zoom out one more time, there we go. And, or I can simply select this cursor. Now off to the right here, we have our slide layout templates. These are pre-rendered slide objects that have to do primarily with the button, slider, or slide choice items. And they're just preset slide objects. So um, we have everything from multiple choice selections to Likert type scales. And with all types of stimuli, so we have images, we have movies, we have text. There are also preset sliders, either vertical here or horizontal here. 
and then different configurations of on-screen buttons. So we want on-screen keyboard, an on-screen number pad, circle layout, anything like that. We have those as available options here for slide layout templates. They just allow you to quickly and easily pre-format your slide objects so you don't have to spend all of the time adding all of these things and setting the correct uh, response properties. ePrime will handle all of that for you. And then if you look off to the right here, we have the option to toggle this background grid on and off. So this grid is mostly just for lining things up in E-Prime and making sure everything is, you know, everything looks good on the slide. If we toggle it off, this is more what it's going to look like at runtime. Along the left-hand side of the screen here, we have a listing of all of our slide sub objects. Now, if you notice, they look very similar to their e-object counterparts. So a text display object looks exactly like a slide text object, and they actually function identically to them as well. So if you have any questions about the properties for any specific slide sub-object, I recommend checking out the video of that actual e-object. So for example, if I want to know how the slide text works, check out the video that we have on the text display object. That's going to show you exactly what I mean there. So to add one of these to your experiment, all you have to do is click on the slide text object or any object that you want and then take your cursor and move it into the slide object. As you can see, the object that you're going to add shows up right next to the cursor and then click anywhere on the screen to add it. And then you can move these objects around however you'd like. You can access their properties page by selecting them first in this drop down panel and then clicking on the sub-object properties page. And these properties pages, again, are identical to their e-object counterpart. So that I recommend just checking out those videos to see what, those, what all of those properties are. But you can add a slide text sub-object, a slide image sub-object, which is useful for displaying images, a slide movie, which is good for displaying movie objects, a slide button, which is just a simple clickable button in E-Prime, a slide choice, which is a multiple choice questionnaire item, so very similar to a Likert type scale. A slide slider object, which is a fully functional slider. A slide sound out, which doesn't have a visual component to it, but will access the computer's sound card and play a sound through it. And the slide sound in, which again doesn't have a visual component, but will access the computer's sound card and will record sound. So that concludes all the properties that we have for the slide object. Thank you very much.